here with Dr. John McDougall, and I believe this is the third time you are on the show. But I think so. It's been a few times. Yeah. It's been a good time. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's so wonderful to have you back on, and um, always a pleasure to talk with you. I know a lot of my followers really love the work that you do and what you promote, so they have submitted questions for you. So I want to start off by just um, asking you about what you're up to these days. Well, I have retired from taking care of patients. And what I do now is I lecture, do webinars, write a few articles here and there. But no, I'm retired. I retired uh, from clinical work. I'm going to be working more in academic work and politi political work. I would like to. I did some of that in the past. And uh, I don't know, to tell you the truth, but uh, I certainly will be contributing. I'll be working at my three and 10 day program in Santa Rosa. We run three and 10 day uh, medical programs for people who are ill with high blood pressure, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, uh, heart disease, weight problems, ball problems. We deal with all of those. Uh, I'm down there at uh, most of those and I give lectures. Then I'll take care of some of the tough problems, I guess. And, uh, <clears throat> And also, uh, you know, uh, watch over the administrative part of the business. It's run by my daughter, Heather McDougall, and we have some fantastic doctors that work here. Well, since, since I saw you uh, last time, Forbes magazine actually wrote an article about our program and how it's saving people lots of money. Like uh, they said it saved uh, CenturyLink, a, a, a communication company about 30, 36% on their medical bills. Yeah, oh, that's a lot of money. <laughs> it is, it, it sure is. You think about the preventative work, not so many people think about how much they're saving in money, financial costs towards surgery and, and pills and things like that. Yeah, but to, to make, to get recognition in Forbes magazine. Right. That's for saving, for saving Century Link, a billion dollar company. 36% on their health care. That's like what we've done with with uh, Whole Foods. They won't give us, or they haven't given me the exact numbers, but they have uh, written on, on my website that they have saved money, and I got a nice personal letter from uh, John Mackey. So we are saving money uh, for people out there, and I think that's one of the few ways that we're going to get this message across is put it in people's pocketbooks. You know, you got to say, look, uh, you're going to have to pay for that bypass surgery. That's going to come out of your mortgage, man. That's right. 150,000 bucks is going to come out of your mortgage. If the, if the doctors are in a good, healthy-minded mood, if things go well, it could be 350,000 comes out of your mortgage just from that one operation. So, uh, yeah, it's money for businesses. It's money for patients. Uh, the ones that suffer mainly out of, out of the ones that benefit under this system are the doctors, the hospitals, and the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, they're basically the ones who distribute the treatments. Now, it'd be nice if all the treatments worked, but they don't. I mean, they work, but do they give the results the patient is expecting? And the answer is few do, especially when it comes to chronic disease. So the patient is paying lots of money, sometimes seventy-five thousand dollars just for one medicine, just just for one year's drug with multiple sclerosis. It costs seventy-five thousand dollars just for the drug, not the needles. There was just a study pu published in it, it, was, it was either it was the Lancet or the British Medical Journal. A study was just published which said. Um, that the drugs do not change the progression of the disease. You know, it changes the rate of relapse, uh, number of lesions, but the rate of progression of disease is measured by, you know, mostly the end point, the number one end point is when you die. Uh, it doesn't change that. Or they could put, pick total disability as a, uh, as a point. Uh, whenever they test it that way, it doesn't seem to make any difference. There's no change in death or disability, and that's what the patient's looking for. Uh, not necessarily fewer lesions on the MRI. They don't feel those. So they don't even feel them coming. Uh, the, brain, the nervous system is painless. 
so they don't feel the attack uh, to the nervous system from our own immune system, which was uh, which was set against us. Our immune, our immune system was set against us by the food we eat, primarily dairy products. And dairy products make an antibody. The antibody attacks the dairy protein, and uh, then the dairy protein goes on and attacks the oligoblasts, which are uh, cells that cover the sheaths of uh, the nerves and they, they get inflamed. That doesn't hurt. And then they become scars. And that doesn't hurt. So things that uh, uh, you can see, like the inflamed lesions and the scars as a result, uh, the patient never knows they're going on. Well, if the patient never knows they're going on, they never have any eventual effect on the endpoints which are death and say permanent disability, then why bother? And they cost $75,000 a year. Why bother if the pictures just look different and it doesn't change the clinical course or the effectual life of the patient? Yeah, let's, um, let, let's talk a little bit about the diet because I think that's something very practical and very simple that people can do to, to prevent these many chronic diseases and, and situations that we were talking about. You recommend a a whole food plant-based diet and to be more specific a starch-based diet um, most most people are aware of your work you're the author of the starch solution yeah this um, is the kind of thing where you really have to decide you want to be better right because uh the solution is simple doesn't cost any anything so nobody's going to promote it to you you know it's not like uh they're going to run ads on tv to tell you buy our uh our cure for ms and it will, you know, change your life in a positive way. You know. Uh, anyway, it, uh, uh, if you can make some money off of it, like needles, and I told you the drug was seventy-five thousand a year. It does nothing in terms of uh, changing the progression of multiple sclerosis. So, uh, you know, if if you could do something, that'd be one thing. But if you don't, which is the case for most chronic diseases like diabetes and heart disease. Yeah, you're cheating the patient. Uh, you're uh, you who are selling. You are a liar and a thief. Criminals, criminals, criminal behavior is to steal and hurt people. And uh, when you sell a drug to somebody for whatever, say the new cholesterol drugs for thirteen thousand dollars a year, uh, you stole their money. Yeah. And you may have done some of them harm. They have side effects from the medication or harm by diverting money they could have spent on good food or other things, diverting it to the drug companies, which make the drugs for pennies a piece. Right. And most people are unaware that, that, you know, they can go through different routes and that's diet. Most people think that, you know, it's just a way of life. I'm just going to take my medication and everything's going to be fine when in reality, that's not the right way people should be going about their health. So going into sort of the practical ways that people can improve their diet, are there any specific ways you recommend people kind of objectively um, look at their diet on and um, to help them succeed on this? Is Do you recommend um, having your patients, for example, count their calories or look at their fat content? Or do you just recommend having them eat as much as they want? Yeah, that's what I do. I have people eat food and eat it to the full satisfaction of their appetite. Uh, if I was a religious person, then I would believe it would be an insult on our creator to have uh, a less perfect creature designed where the appetite did not match the needs of the patient's activity or growth needs or so on. It just doesn't make any sense. So if you find the right foods, that ought to, they ought to taste good. They ought to be appetite satisfying. Uh, and they ought to support good health. Um, let me kind of go into some of the criticisms that um, you and I probably get all the time. And that is plant-based nutrients are less bioavailable than animal-based nutrients. And that it's inferior to eat a, basically a plant-based diet and that we have to eat. Um, meat and dairy. Can you just sort of comment on this common, uh, common um, uh, argument that people give 
Yeah, they, they, they could stop themselves right away if they wanted to. They could think about strong animals. What's right. the diet? You know, an elephant, a giraffe, or gorilla. There's a diet for every animal, designed for every single animal. And the diet for human beings is a diet based on starch. Now, how do I know that? Well, I learned it uh, the first time when I was a sugar plantation doctor on the Big Island of Hawaii back between 1973 let's see, 73? Yeah, 1973 and 1976. I worked as a sugar plantation doctor, and I took care of 5,000 people who lived on a sugar plantation in uh, on the Big Island. I saw where a lot of those instruments came from up there, surgical instruments. I put myself through medical school as a surgical tech. I was a nurse. That's why I, that's why I had to, had to pay for everything. To do, do that, I had to learn a skill. And this is a very difficult skill, uh, usually performed by women, not always. Uh, but it is as a nurse working in the operating room. I was a surgical nurse. I held uh, retractors and, and needle threaders and right. scissors, things like that, and handed them to the performing surgeon. And uh, as a result, I, uh, I worked there over, over three years, put myself through medical school. Occasionally, uh, I would forget to take something out of my pocket. And then, and I'd take it home, and then I'd leave it on, on, the, on the dresser. Right. And it's called stealing, but I didn't do it intentionally, but that doesn't make it any difference. And then I went to uh, work in the plantation, did the same thing. We did heart operations there. We did uh, all kind of delivered babies, all kinds of things. And I was in the same situation. I would collect instruments, just a few here and there, not intentionally. Well, I got graduated and I went into internal medicine instead of surgery. Those instruments kind of laid around the house. Uh, I would use them when the kids got a laceration or, you know, had some other thing. They had to uh, take a plastic ball out of one of the kids' noses. You know, all kinds of crazy things. So I used those instruments to take care of the family for 30, or uh, let's see, about 44 years, the kids. Uh, anyway, uh, our house burned down October 9th, 2017, just like 5,000 other houses did in Santa Rosa. Yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry to hear about the, the fires. I did hear about that news, and I did want to ask you, um, you know, how everything is going, how you're settling into your new area. Well, and we're up in Portland. The clinic is still in Santa Rosa. Amir and I moved up here to Portland, and it's an experience that really, I, if you ask me what it was like, I can't tell you. I mean, I don't know if I ever go through it, to tell you the truth, what all that meant. I lost my house, and... Uh, I lost three cars. I got I got out with a tennis shoe and this, and this computer. Uh, there were a few, you know, knickknacks in our house that we wanted for personal family uh, reasons. We had some pictures, some drawings, some paintings, and so on that were important to us. But I really wanted this because this this that's a box if you look up there can you see it up there yeah we have a clear view of it so it looks like a bunch of um surgical equipment yeah it's a, it's a these these two top here they're, they're the stainless steel box and the rest of the instruments are scissors and needle holders and knife uh, holders and things like that so the last minute before any more scraping would ever be done my son-in-law found this and then they put them in on a plastic picture frame like you see. And uh, so we put it up in our new home in Portland uh, as a reminder, a pleasant reminder of, for, of well, 40 years of, 50 years of practice. Yeah. I did surgery, I did, uh, caught 100 babies, and I did uh, brain surgery in the middle of the night. Now you're talking about uh, something I did 50 years ago. So uh, I, you know, I was quite a, a, a well-rounded doctor in the sense of doing many, many things and understanding many things to do. I'll take care of people. Well, it's amazing that you actually got into nutrition because not many medical doctors make that connection about the power of food. Well, two things had to happen. One is I had to realize what standard medicine was. 
you know, I, I went to medical school like all the medical students did, I bet. There are very few exceptions. Uh, they go to medical school to help people. The greatest fun in life comes from helping people. And so they go to life, uh, go to medical school to learn this occupation to help people. And the fact that doctors make a, make a lot of money is okay too. Uh, but they're not the top paid. You know, you go to Wall Street and then you're talking about real big bucks for, for people who want to get money out of their business. But most doctors go because it's interesting, respected field, and mostly you help other people. So I'm in uh, medical school and then off as a firm confirmation that I'm correct in my observations. I found out that I did a lot of help when it came to acute problems. Acute problems are things like broken bones, you know, torn toenails. <laughs> just about everything. <laughs> just know, yeah, you cut yourself, you burn yourself. Those are those are things that happen after one assault on the body, and you, and you just stop assaulting the body, and the body heals. That's it. It's very simple. That's why I was so good. I, I just told him, stop, you know, stop cutting yourself with that knife, and this will all go away. Or stop breaking that bone and this will all go away. So it's just like any doctor, if you add support, maybe a splint, you know, bandages and so on, you can help the healing process a little bit. Yeah. But when it comes to chronic disease, chronic disease is different. Chronic disease, just by uh, you, just by using the word chronic, tells you that it's not going to get better. It's chronic. Right. It's there for so, a long time. A long time. It says long time. Chronic, chronic degeneration. Chronic. You know, I, you understand most yes. understand the term chronic with it. So um, you're not going to get over it. So right. when somebody tells you you have chronic hypertension or chronic heart pain or chronic uh, uh, arthritis or whatever, right. they may give you some pills to cover up the symptoms, but they can't stop the problem. Just like with that MS we talked about, the drug covers up some of the symptoms, symptoms secondary endpoints, which are, as I told you, they're relapses and, and scars. Uh, but uh, they really don't give you the positive endpoints you, you're looking for when you treat chronic disease. You get uh, covering up of the, or, or, or the discovery of these uh, secondary endpoints. And maybe you can quiet them down a little bit and make them look a little bit less angry and destructive, but they won't go away because it's chronic disease. The difference between, uh, between acute and chronic disease is uh, is the repetitive action of chronic disease, the repetitive injury. So let's just say you, uh, oh, let's just take something really gross. Let's just take uh, your hand, for example, and you pour acid on it one day. And you get uh, uh, blisters and redness and, I mean, it hurts, it's terrible. Right. And you let that go for four, five, six days, and finally the scars are starting to heal in. The redness is going away, and if it's not too deep, it won't be left with any real scars. That uh, just goes away, and maybe you remember it 10 years later. However, if you develop a habit of pouring a half a cup of acid on your skin every day, or once a week, Pretty soon, the end response to healing this inflammation is scar tissues. So you get cirrhosis of the liver, or you get emphysema in the lungs, or you get uh, multiple scars in multiple sclerosis. Uh, these are scars. These are not going to go away. This is chronic disease. And the only way to fix it is to fix time. Right. And that's not going to happen. Uh, all, but you can do something. The damage that's done, and it's usually a lot less damage than people believe. The damage that's actually done that's not reversible is really quite small in most cases, at least to get you back to a functional life. Like, for example, multiple sclerosis. If you change your diet, we find that um, about 85% of people comply to the diet we teach. 
and about nearly 90% get off all of their high blood pressure and diabetes medicine. And we haven't really tested the MS drugs yet as far as what to do with them. But, uh, you know, if you have a chronic disease like multiple sclerosis and the chronic disease treatments don't work, then you have to find something that does. Well, fortunately, and this has been discovered thousands of years ago, uh, the cause of chronic disease is repeated injury, almost always secondary to what we do to ourselves, like, oh, right, right, or, or day after a, day, glass, a glass after a whiskey, or or the food. It really is the food that causes about ninety percent of the diseases people have. Uh, the food we eat the wrong food. And it causes obesity, which is obvious. 80% of people are overweight, 39% are obese. Uh, it causes constipation, obviously, anybody who eats that diet. Uh, it causes indigestion. It causes, you know, if you keep into it and you get unlucky, it causes problems like chest pain, which require heart surgery or you die. Those two shouldn't be linked to get together because heart surgery does not save lives in chronic disease. Well, I, it was a mistake I made, okay? If you su su suggested that heart surgery, if I, you think I suggested that heart surgery save lives in chronic disease, you misheard me. It does not. It's old scars in the arteries. They're not gonna go away with surgery. Right. Now you can prevent the new ones. And you do that by changing your diet. Uh, I put, uh, I wrote a book called The Healthiest Diet on, on the Planet. I think it's a good book. Lots of pictures, so those of you who like to watch pictures, you can watch the pictures. The Healthiest Diet on the Planet, and it is a picture book. There are 66 pictures in it. And it talks about why people are sick, what are the pictures, not words, you don't have to read. And uh, it's on my website, by the way. It's free on my website. My, my Dr. McDougall's color picture book on food poisoning is free on my website. So you can go there and read that but you can also buy the book. And it tells you um, that we've known about this kind of illness, source of illness for thousands of years with the pharaohs and the priests of the past and the kings and the queens and the aristocrats causing themselves gout and obesity and diabetes, chronic diseases due to eating like a king and queen. Well, you know, back uh, uh, 2000 years ago, there were only a few kings and queens Everybody else was a worker and they had to grow the barley and the wheat and the rice and the potatoes and so on. And then uh, there were some special people in each society which were known as royalty. Uh, they got to do special things like eat special food. And what they did is they ate the animals that were eating other people's rice and corn and soybeans and so on. Right. So they got the food secondarily. Well, it, it enriches the food when you eat it. So when the chicken eats the grain, it concentrates and enriches the food in components that cause sickness, like fat and cholesterol and um, microbial contamination and so on. Well, those are the foods that make you sick, are animal products and also vegetable oils. Vegetable oils are not food, they're, uh, they're a component of food. They're um, an isolated component of food. Nothing else is with it but with the oil. No vitamins, no minerals, no nothing. Empty calories. Empty calories, but the calories are also quite toxic. These are the easiest stored calories, nine calories per gram, as opposed to white sugar at four calories per gram. They're the easiest stored calories. Uh, they are, uh, uh, they don't have anything else to bring to you that you want, like good vitamins and minerals and fiber and that sort of stuff. Uh, they process them pretty good, so they're not a big source of, uh, of uh, bacterial or, or microbial infection. Right. So it's not a big source of infection, but it's a big source of uh, empty calories, which has been known to promote heart disease, especially omega-6 fats, and promote bleeding, especially omega-3 fats. Now, people look at the positive parts of this. And they say, well, if I take fish oil, I won't have a heart attack. Yeah, but you might bleed to death. You know. Right. It has effects, both positive and negative. Uh, you take fish oil, if a blood clot suddenly forms in your heart artery, 
uh, that fish oil might prevent it from totally clogging the artery. It might. It might. It also could cause some bleeding. Yep. And that's a problem. Yeah. Well, the food solves the problem without the adverse effects. Uh, studies done back into the 1950s showed that if you took, take people who have very serious, very serious acute and chronic coronary artery disease, I mean, they're paralyzed. They can't get across the room. And you put on a healthy diet, they start walking better in five days. And uh, their incidence of dying of heart disease is no greater than people who have surgery. That's the thing that kind of struck them in the early 60s, is when they did the first gross uh, comparisons of uh, chronic artery disease. This is chronic, not a sudden heart attack. The chronic artery disease and uh, our surgical techniques, which was uh, open heart surgery or bypass surgery, first became popular at Cleveland Clinic. Uh, they found that these procedures did not save lives. And then they went on uh, 10 years later to 1978, and they started doing uh, percutaneous uh, interventions. Uh, this is an angiogram, or leading to an angioplasty, where they stick a, <clears throat> a kind of a plastic wire uh, into your veins or your arteries, and they look at them and sometimes they break up the plaque and usually they put in a stent to hold the thing open. Well, they were shocked when they found out that uh, that people didn't live any longer, even when they compared them to people who were just as sick and didn't get the treatments. So can you talk a little bit about maybe some of the foods that you do recommend and possibly even just walk us through a day of eating for you, what that looks like through breakfast, lunch, and dinner, just so people have an idea of, you know, what type of foods to eat to really be successful with this? Well, it just depends a lot on the person. you got to get the food in. That's the hard part. If you don't have a way of getting the food in, you're in big trouble. Then the easiest way to get the food is McDonald's or Burger King and Taco Bell. Then, you know, you have to resort to these people who do, a, at best, a... I don't, even, I don't even think the word is passable, uh, but let's give the word pass up a, a passable uh, product that will keep people alive. And not good health, but it'll keep them alive. It won't kill them as fast as the American diet, if you order right. Right. You order, you order Burger King, and you want the, you say you want the king, and they serve you the king, and you eat the king, you're in trouble. <laughs> so, But if you went in and ordered a salad or... You know, some places used to have baked potatoes and so on. All right, for me, this morning I've already had, Mary and I have already had uh, Dr. McDougall's Right Foods Oatmeal. That's the brand I brought out this morning. We have a company called Dr. McDougall's Right Foods, which sells our food in over 6,000 stores across the country. Very popular, very tasty. Yeah, I've had some of it. Have you had it? Yeah, 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 I like it. Totally inexpensive and very popular too. I can say six thousand stores, and we probably have forty products. Right, and you want to compete with some of the other less quality stuff that's out there, and has animal products, lots of oils. So it's really great to have something there as a better alternative. Well, it's clean stuff, no animals in it, no extra oils. So anyway, that's how I started out this morning. This afternoon, I'll probably go on to. Uh, Yesterday I made a Mary an avocado sandwich. There you go. Uh, I don't know. Maybe a Dr. Maturo soup. Uh, veggie burger. I don't know. Something this afternoon. And then this evening we'll probably likewise do something pretty simple. Uh, last evening she did uh, a soup along with rice. Right. Just vegetable soup. And she often uses the Instant Pot. The oh, Instant that's... Pot. That's a lifesaver. Yeah. Oh, it's my gosh. And we could cook a meal here in just a few minutes and have it ready, mashed and everything. And so I'd say one of my favorite meal, meals is mashed potatoes, frozen cor corn, heated, of course, and a gravy Mary makes. Oh, that gravy is so popular. <laughs> People absolutely love it. Yeah, for years I've heard you talk. That's your favorite food. It's just mashed potatoes, some corn, and, and gravy. But it sounds amazing. I mean, who wouldn't love mashed potatoes? Well, I don't know. I mean, if, you had to, if you had a choice, here's a cup 
of mashed potatoes, nothing added. And here's a cup of raw cow leg. You choose. Right, right. I'm just on appearance, just on taste, just on smell. Forget about nutrition. We've already beat you with a food you love, which one you can hardly get down. In fact, you can't unless you cover it with steak sauce or heavy doses of salt. You can't even get it down. All right, so it's a starch-based diet. Uh, I think uh, you can make your starch as simple as far as variety is concerned as you want. In other words, you could just live on corn or just on potatoes or just on rice or wild rice or soybeans or whatever. Uh, I have to give you a qualification to that. And that is that uh, starches that are of underground origin, underground, like potatoes and sweet potatoes and bulbs and corns, uh, they are complete foods. They have all the vitamins. The potatoes are considered the anti-scurvy food, whereas they criticize vegetables for not having enough vitamin C. Well, not in the case of underground starch sources. Right. They have all everything you need except for B12, which I won't go into today until you force me. I don't want to. Uh, above ground starch sources of starch organs would be uh, uh, their seeds. There would be grains and legumes stored above ground in the plant parts. And they're loaded with calories, but they miss vitamin A and C. So if you're going to have a diet exclusively, say, of corn or rice, you must add some A or C in the form, I would suggest, of oranges or asparagus or right. something you like. You don't have to have much just to get the A and C. Otherwise, it's a very complete diet. I was going to say sweet potatoes are one of the healthiest foods on the planet. They, um, in the blue zones, they um, that's a huge popular food that they eat, especially on Okinawa. And um, like you said, it's a complete food. It has vitamin C. It's got pretty much everything you need to survive. Um, and also, Dr. McDougall, I, I kind of do want to touch upon uh, B12 just for a little bit. We've kind of talked about it in the past. Um, so right. most people kind of know at this point what you recommend. But um, I was just curious, through all your years of practice, have you ever seen a B12 deficiency? Uh, only when I was in regular training, I saw people who had stomach surgery. And the result is the stomach could no longer produce intrinsic factor. So it couldn't combine with that extrinsic factor, which is vitamin B12, and it couldn't easily be absorbed. But maybe I saw one case there. I've never seen one. I've never seen a case of dietary B12 deficiency disease. Right. Uh, people can come in with blood tests. Uh, but, of course, you've got the fact that the normals are uh, determined by someone else. So you can have a uh, normal B12, say, 200, 200 picograms. All right. Somebody else says 50. Somebody else says 600. You know, depending upon the normal range that has been decided, uh, you will fall into positive or negative uh, category based on that blood test. I think you should be above 80. It's a small factor to take B12. You know, it's not toxic. It's not expensive. Uh, as far as I know, there are no serious adverse effects, but I reserve the right to change that opinion on adverse effects. Yeah, sounds like it's a very rare case, though, that you've seen yeah. and not very yeah, common. But why bother? It's, if everything else is, uh, is uh, unable to be criticized because it's right, why bother with the B12 crap? Right. You know, my attitude is take your B12 like I prescribe, which is a very low-dose pill, once in a while to keep your levels at what I said, you know. And you check your B12 level maybe once a year to see it's there. B12 is the last uh, known vitamin discovered. Right. And uh, it's made by bacteria mainly. And some, and some, uh, some parasites make some effective B12, but mostly bacteria. Right. People don't make it. Horses don't make it. Cows don't make it. Mm-hmm. Uh, no plant makes B12, but these bacteria do make the B12, and animals uh, can absorb the B12 into their tissues and concentrate it. And then when people say eat a, uh, uh, eat a pig, pig arm, 
So it eats the pig arm, and then they get the B12 that was manufactured by the by the pig's food. Right. You know, so you might as well go directly to say a uh, supplemental source. Yep. I haven't found anything better. I, you know, it's just I'm sure there's a better natural whatever, but it's not going to make any difference. Yeah. I just get a, 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 a B12 source and. And I think uh, there's still argument out there as to what source of B12 is best, the cyano, the hydroxy, or the methyl, methyl yeah, the methyl. And so I, I tell people who are really concerned, and I'm not saying they can't or shouldn't be, uh, really concerned they should just do a combination. Right. You know, take one of each a week. Just to be safe. Yeah, I mean, if you go, I don't. But uh, there are, there are. You could argue that's a smart thing to do. Yeah. yeah. You know, it takes you about 30, 30 years to run out of B twelve, and then your risk is about one in a million. But right. Yeah. No. But uh, like you said, like I mean, most people are not dying from B twelve deficiency. They're dying because of heart disease, cancer, and that's the problems that we're addressing with our recommendations. It's hard for people. <clears throat> Uh, back in 2013, the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, they published an article on the Chinese and their incidence of diabetes. And they found in right around the year 2013, they found that about 12% uh, of the population had diabetes, frank diabetes. And uh, of, the, of those who weren't uh, profoundly diabetic, half the population was pre-diabetic. And that was in 2013. Now, I don't know how much traveling you guys do, but I used to do a lot. And I, whenever I'd fly next to people from China, with few exceptions, I don't want to get into the exceptions. Let's just say I found an awful lot of fat Chinese. <laughs> Whereas in 1980, there was no obesity in China. Fewer than 1% of the population had diabetes in China. Their diet was 90% white rice. Yes, when they got rid of the white rice, now brown is better, but who's counting? When they got rid of the white rice or, and substituted for American foods, they started looking like Americans. And that's the analogy you should see with your friends and relatives and teachers and employers and so on, you look at them, you go, I know you're sick. You're eating like uh, King Henry VIII or Santa Claus. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what Santa Claus ate. Lots of cookies and milk, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, but, but you got to get that uh, starch intake up to around 90% on the plate. Not just the calories, but you got to look at that plate. You got to go, yep. That's about 90% potatoes or sweet potatoes, which you don't need B12 with. But if you say, well, yep, that's about 90% corn, but I'll add a little bit of uh, kale, a little broccoli. Right. For interest and uh, all that, also that vitamin A and C, and because it's an above ground storage organ. Right, right. And that's your meal. And you can have that <clears throat> 10 times a day, three times a day, once a day. Uh, but that, I think that that proportion is determined by the eyeball, not, not by, a, not by a, a scale or anything like that. Just look at the darn food. You know, almost everything you're eating should be starch and a few vegetables and the animal foods, you know, they're just not going to hit it. You can eat them. You can eat them. You're violating in my in my life, but I'm not you, so you shouldn't really care. You violate principles of global warming. You violate principles of animal abuse. You invited you 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 you're uh, you are putting out signs to other people when you eat and look that way that you are a stupid and considerate person. Stupid, ignorant, ignorant would be better. You are an uninformed, that's even nicer, uninformed person. Right. Or you just don't care. Because it affects so many things. Like you said, it's not just our health, but you're also conveying the message that, you know, I mean, it's, it's not good for our environment. Like you said, it's not good for the animals that, um, you know, unfortunately pay to 
for for someone to have a burger or a glass of milk or something like that. Um, Dr. McDougall, I'm not sure how much, because uh, I know you're retired now, I'm not sure how much you've been kind of paying attention to what's out there these days, but um, there's a medical doctor by the name Sean Baker. I'm not sure if you heard of him. Um, let me kind of just give you a brief about oh, but, him. But let me tell you, I've heard about almost all of them. Well, hold on now, because you'll have to listen to this. So this this guy not only eats a 100% carnivorous diet, 100% meat, no vegetable, no starch, nothing like that. He also mm -hmm. promotes this and claims that what he's doing is the way to go. This is the way humans are designed to eat. Um, he says that uh, cholesterol and saturated fat is actually healthy for you. Like this person is doing completely op the opposite side of the spectrum of what we recommend. Yeah, Atkins was like that in fact. Uh, you know, I was I was with him when he started back in 1970. I was in the, on the same playground, different teams on the same playground. That's Robert Atkins, and there have been lots of people who have recommended these all meat diets. Uh, they're dangerous. Uh, they've been declared dangerous by the Heart Association and the Cancer Society. Uh, anybody who thinks it's normal or natural to eat an animal should do it. But don't give me any of this BS about taking the feathers off or cutting the fur off or, by God, goodness, if you really like it, you wouldn't spoil perfectly good meat, piece of meat by cooking it, would you? Right, exactly. You just eat it and, raw. And then when you had done cooking it, you, you wouldn't eat it because there's no taste to it or it tastes terrible. So let's put some barbecue sauce on it or steak sauce. I mean, even, even when I used to eat raw fish 40 years ago. You know, we had a hot mustard that went with it to give it some taste. Or so with a bunch of rice and um, veggies like in sushi or something. Like yeah, it's right, disguised right. in there. Yeah, that's right. And uh, But it's a hot mustard, I think, that came about to, for, the, for the sole purpose of getting the flesh of the fish down right. to the palatable. What I think is compl is uh, is odd, Dr. McDougall, is that he's published uh, medical d data for himself. So he's put it out in the public, um, his blood results, and you see that um, he has elevated LDL cholesterol. His blood sugar is even high, and he's not even consuming any carbohydrates, um, which just raises all kinds of red flags oh, there. This is the man you're talking about? Yeah, the, the same man, yeah, Sean Baker. And he's a medical doctor, too. Just yeah, promoting that, this. That proves to you how stupid medical doctors can be. <laughs> There's a guy out there. He was 300 pounds. I got in a fight with him on the internet one time. He was another one like that. He was 300 pounds. And he was trying to tell me that the same kind of diet was... I, I bet it's one of those names that Wait, I really it, Was that... Hold on now. Was that um, Jimmy Moore you're talking about? Yeah. You went on his podcast? <laughs> yep. I, I made a response video to that. I remember that. That was back in, I think, 2013. You know, people got so mad at me because I, I was very direct with them. But I did tell them at the end, I said, you know, I really care about you. What was his name again? Jimmy Moore, I believe it was Jimmy Moore. Jimmy Moore. Yeah, it was Jimmy Moore. I, I, you know, I, 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 I'm a doctor. I said, I would like to help you. I said, any, any chance you'd give me to come to my clinic, let me help you. Because you know, 300 pounds was a low weight for this guy. I think his brother had died of a heart attack at a younger age. And uh, yeah, there are people out there that could do anything for a while. But I don't, I don't, I don't even care. You know, the next new diet. The last book I published, The Healthiest Diet on the Planet, my agent came to me, said they want to give you a whole bucket of money to write another book. I said, I'll write another book. I said, you guys, I wrote The Start Solution, which was the best book I ever wrote. And I can't really repeat that. I can make it another, another enjoyable book, but that really is the book. Yeah, my agent came to me when she got the idea that we ought to do another book because The Start Solution is sold worldwide. I and mean, we have it in Spanish now on our website. And it's, it's really a very popular book worldwide. My agent came to me and said, uh, Harper won. Harper Collins would like you to write another book. I said, I don't want to write another book. So a lot of time, a lot of dedication. 
and uh, people don't read books anymore. And that's why I did The Healthiest Diet on the Planet as a picture book. That's smart. Yeah, because it catches the message on like that. People can look at the pictures. I think if that's the book I'm thinking of, you have like even like traffic lights, kind of like yeah, an easy yeah. indicator, you know, yeah. this is the foods you should be yeah, eating. So I told her, and we were in the process, this is a book agent. She represents a lot of authors. I said, you know what I believe you guys do? Is you get about four different philosophies on eating and you find four relatively physically appealing men or women and you have them make up a diet doesn't matter all meat all carrots all potatoes all fish all whatever avoid gluten and extra glue well, it doesn't make any difference and we'll see how pretty we can make the book look and then what we're going to do this is what i told her i believe they do at harper collins the rest of the book stores they get at the back of the room and they take the books that they produce and they throw them at the wall. And whichever one sticks is the diet of the year for that book company. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't think they put in any more thought than that. If one sticks, that's the one we're going with. Well, yeah, I guess the one that probably has like, you know, the certain type of title and the way like it could catch on. Well, it's not something new. It's got to be something new. Look, people are looking, oh, there's, it has to be a reason I'm still fat and sick and uh okay you know i have all these pills to take there's got to be a reason i'm missing the secret somebody's got to have the secret right? oh it's a new book it's not a new and let's put the word secret in the title but uh, the truth doesn't change there is a diet for human beings and that diet is based on starch like the asians were starch eaters and the people from uh, central america lived on corn the, the people of corn the mayans and the aztecs the Incas were primarily potato eaters, and they had 500 different species of potatoes down there last time I counted. And uh, people in the Middle East, you know, the place where you turn on TV every day, and what you see is pieces. You see people playing in the field every day with these great big guns. Well, their diet has been and still is a diet of starch. 70% of their diet was starchy foods when last time I looked at it, which was 10 years ago. But I'm sure it's not changed much. They probably put a few fast food restaurants in, but you know, it's, uh, it was 70% starch back when we were going to the war with uh, George, the first George W. Bush. You know, what's the diet of people all over the world? It's starch based, always has been, always will be. The exceptions are the kings and the queens of the old, Back a few years ago, we only had a few people who had enough money to eat like that. Now, over half the population of the world can eat that way and does. And now, the World Health Organization reports that there is more sickness from overnutrition than undernutrition. And this is very expensive. I mean, after all, in our country, the greatest expense in our country for our gross national product is medical care. It's the, it's the only growing phase of our economy is the medical care. So you're dealing with big bucks here. If you, if you could, i um, just going to ask you a hypothetical question, but if you could, what would you change about the medical system? Well, I, well, I do. What I do is this. So first of all, I don't think uh, uh, medical care is a privilege. I think it's a right. Okay? Just like I think it's a right to have water, clean water, clean air. And I think people should be fed around the world. Uh, I don't think this should be, ever be treated as a privilege, but rather as a right. We need universal health care. I, I, I petitioned for it back in the 1970s. Got no place, and you know why. It blow the, all the uh, health insurance companies off the water. And now there are efforts again to do universal health care. All right, so you get universal health care. And then you get one guy writing the check. Could be a girl, but a guy. Somebody really tough. I don't care whether she's a girl or a boy. I just want her tougher than heck. A good leader. Uh, a good leader, yeah. And you say, you get out there and you say, you know, it's been proven in 100 studies that bypass surgery doesn't work in this case. No more. Uh, it's been proved with all those new diabetic drugs that you advertise, help cholesterol in addition to blood sugar. That this is fraud. This is fake news. The benefits are in the one, two, or three percent 
area when it comes to reducing, say, uh, a marker of, uh, of heart disease, like bad cholesterol or good cholesterol. One or two percent difference, but it's significant, so they get to brag it. And that's what you see on TV. You see, buy our new blood sugar pill. Not only does it lower your blood sugar, but it reduces your risk of high dying of heart disease. This is all fraud, all fake. It's not been shown to reduce your risk of heart disease. It reduces the risk factors, secondary endpoints, like cholesterol. People will die high cholesterol. Anyway, uh, it's just big money out there. So here I'm. Uh, I'm, I'm head of uh, Universal Healthcare, and I'm. I'm going to be like it or not. I'm going to be a dictator. Uh, and of course, I'm going to have uh, an armed guard around me bigger than bigger than that like, Trump guy. <laughs> Much bigger. <laughs> and then what I'm going to do is I go through and I clean out the hospitals. I just clean them right out. I I go through with a triage. And I'd uh, pick the patients that could be helped, pick those that couldn't, couldn't pick people who really knew how to help them, uh, stop forcing surgeries, chemotherapies in particular, on people when we know the treatments don't work. I mean, we know it is proved over and over again. But this is a free country, free trade, free speech, whatever you want. Well, am I correct in saying that there's an incentive system for medical doctors promoting as many surgeries as they can or as many pills as they can and it sort of reinforces them to continue with that practice. You know, I don't know how direct or indirect that goes. You open an office, you've got to put shoes on your kids, pay the tuition. You got to pay your uh, your office personnel. Uh, you got to pay rent. So you, you have to pay, in one sense, the pressures put on the, by the doctor, by the products that are being sold, yeah, that, that causes problems. Yeah. You know, because these are uh, expensive products. And I would say industry does push them in that way by putting out the most expensive. I mean, there are cholesterol drugs now that I can buy at Walmart, 90 pills for 10 bucks. These are your older statins that work as good as the new sta or the new uh, statins, but the new drugs that work in the liver. They work as well, but one drug is is uh, like ten dollars uh, ten dollars for ninety pills, and the other drugs is thirteen hundred dollars per pill or shot. Right. Yeah. You know, so there's a tremendous amount of pressure, financial pressure there, and and then I'll tell you another thing they do is say you got a a, a brand new uh, MRI that uh, that images prostate glands. Okay, big business. So you, you have three hospitals in town. You go to hospital A and you say, we got this new machine. And what it does is it'll pick up MRI, it'll pick up a prostate tumor that's uh, half a centimeter size. Maybe at best a centimeter, you know, that's about a half an inch. And we're gonna give it to hospital A, we're gonna give it here to Francis Hospital. Oh, we're just gonna give it to them to let your community learn about it. Well. Hospital number two, which is George's hospital, sees what the, the uh, manufacturer just did and said, well, we're not gonna get any more referrals. Could you give us one of those machines? Oh, no, 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 only the first one's free. We'll sell you the second one and the third one and the fourth one. So, you know, they pressure doctors to put, uh, uh, to put the latest and greatest in their office. So it costs a lot of money to run an office. So yeah, drug companies do that. And then there's uh, licenses and uh, lots of different things. Right. It's, it's hard to make a living as a doctor. I think in the system, now I didn't work in the system when I was younger, I had a private practice. But in the system working at uh, OHSU, which my son does, he's a full professor, doctor there. You can expect to make maybe 200,000 a year uh, at some of the other places, uh, private pay, you make a little bit more, a little bit less. Yeah. And you get some nice advantages too. So it's not, it's not a dirt job, yeah. it's not, but it's not, it's not uh, the most lucrative, easiest job in the world. Yeah. And it seems like it's, it's kind of complicated. Like you said, like we want to help our patients, but at the same time also take care of our doctors. 
in a way that they would be happy to promote preventative medicine, in other words. They would have to do that by a capitated system. This, this is something that happened 20 years ago. You know, see, in the 1970s, people, uh, medical people, doctors, etc., knew this. We had the Surgeon General's uh, Dietary Goals for the U.S. in 1977 by C. Everett Coop. We, we knew why people were sick. We knew what to do to solve the problems. Uh, but we didn't do it. We went in the opposite direction. This is the uh, drug companies figured out what we were doing. They were gonna, they weren't gonna uh, have their business die. So uh, the uh, the food industries have responded back by uh, building lobbying groups, big war chest banks, uh, to take over the commercials and so on, so that uh, you know, so that the uh, industry doesn't start losing. Okay, so we have someone who had lost about 30 pounds after switching to a plant-based diet and is now getting too thin and trouble maintaining their weight. What changes should they make to their diet and exercise plan? Okay, I think it's, I think it's my May 2013 newsletter. It's what you do if you lose too much weight. I think you'll find all the information there. I think if you don't there... You might find it in my November 2013 newsletter where I used Walter Kempner's charts on what Walter Kempner thought you other way. Uh, what this newsletter, what the general information is, is if you're losing too much weight, you should follow fat people around. I knew I'd get in trouble for that. I knew I'd get in trouble. <laughs> uh, and ask them what they eat. Uh, if you're losing too much weight, I think uh, you need to go on a richer, richer plant foods. You need to eat, start eating, um, uh, let's see, you could add nuts and seeds and avocados to your diet. Right. Uh, you could add uh, more bread because it has some refining. You could be more careful about the foods you pick so that you like them. It's hard to sit down and eat something you don't like. I can sit down and I can eat beans and rice all day long or mashed potatoes and corn with that gravy on it. But if you put some, you know, if you put uh, you know, something I don't like, some vegetable I, I, I don't like, I'm not going to ever learn to eat it. Right. So right. pay attention to that. And then uh, you add nuts and seeds and avocados. You, know, you can start making juices because that brings out more calories. So more vegetable juice, more fruit juice. Eating more, more fruits, more fruits. You don't even have to go to the destroying of the vegetable part by grinding it. You could just eat more fruit, and that would help. Uh, and then dried fruits would be okay. That'd be a good, good start. Right. But I think the important thing is, number one, to get a realistic attitude about what you should weigh. In the May 2013, and I believe the November no, excuse me, May 2003, not 13, 3. May 2003 was uh, on how to stop losing too much weight. And November 2013 is Walter Kempner's weight loss chart. And I think both of those will help you. And I'll have all that, of course, in the show notes that people can easily find and click on. Um, this next person was wondering, they have just switched to a uh, whole food plant-based diet, no oil, starches. Should they have any concerns um, because they are on medication? It depends on the medication in their situation. Right. You know, you know some medications, uh, the food has to be taken into account. Uh, like, for example, people have kidney disease. They have to greatly limit their potassium intake, which would be fruits and vegetables. But there are some lower potassium grains that we could pick. Uh, people with high triglycerides, they have to limit their simple sugars, including their fruit and fruit juice and uh, dried fruits. Yeah. So, you know, it depends on the person, what they have, what they need. If you need to gain weight, we just talked about what I would do to gain weight. Right. Yep. So maybe uh, that's more of like a specific type of topic. This person is 19 years old. Um, they are eating a starch-based diet and are saying that sometimes they just don't feel like, they just don't feel quite full unless they eat um, 
a little bit of fat in their diet, such as uh, flax seeds, avocados. Is that okay to add maybe flax seeds or pumpkin seeds to oatmeal or avocado in their salad or something? Yeah, that's really okay, especially if you're not trying to lose weight, you need more energy. But it's a natural thing for people to, uh, to feel uh, satisfied differently when they change their food. I think the best example is the Chinese restaurant syndrome. People tell you, you go to a Chinese restaurant and eat a whole plate of food and you still feel hungry. That's because it's a starch-based meal plan. Now later on you go back after you change your diet and you're used to a starch-based meal plan and you try something your friends are eating, like the base of their diet would be chicken or beef or something, you'll find it very unsatisfying. It's just an adaptation, that's all. And the food that you buy on this diet should be a lot cheaper and it is when you buy it at the grocery store, but when you buy it in restaurants, you know, if you order, order go to a Japanese restaurant or a shrimp salad, they're not going to give you for you less money just because you told them to leave the shrimp out. So, should be, but it isn't. Anyway, uh, so if you're not feeling satisfied, just put some more time and effort into it and figure out what you like. Pick your favorite spices. Salt is a great spice for people to use when it comes to uh, liking the food. Of course, salt has some deleterious effects, not many, but there's a big effort out there to uh, low, tell people low salt, basically because nutritionists, and dietitians, doctors don't know anything else to tell them except low salt. To what extent um, should people use salt? Like, is there a certain amount of milligrams that you recommend up to or? Uh, I could. You have to eat over 500 milligrams, which is no sodium. That's what Walter Kemper used to feed his, pa his patients. He would actually wash the rice. <laughs> 50 milligrams is what you need. About 500 is considered quite low. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, not a goal I would look for is 500. But testing experimentally, it's about 50 milligrams. Uh, I eat about 1,000 milligrams. If I get more than that, and I don't like the food, they just ruin the dish for me. Uh, the recommendation of most uh, uh, health organizations uh, say that you should eat about 3,500 or no, 3,500 or 2,300. Yeah, no, I'm trying to think. I think the American Heart Association, I believe, recommends 1,500 because they're trying to manage heart disease. For people who have heart disease. Yeah, yeah, but I think the regular dietary guidelines are around 2,300. So that's what I remember. Yeah. And as low as 150 or right. 1,500 grams when they're on a when they're on high blood pressure pills and things like that. But I know plenty of people who write to me and tell me that they're doing this healthy starch-based plant-based diet, but just uh, avoid salt completely. How do you feel about that? That's okay. Yeah. If you're into suffering. <laughs> yeah, no, I personally write. It's very difficult to do it because salt, uh, it kind of gives the food a little bit more flavor and makes things more interesting. But I personally don't see a problem with it, but I was just curious to, uh, on your take of that. Well, the difference is if you, if you reduce the sodium intake by 2,300 milligrams, your reduction in blood pressure caused when you measure it is about uh, three millimeters on the top number, the systolic, and about a half a millimeter on the bottom number, the diastolic. So it really doesn't make a lot of difference by dropping 2,300 milligrams. In regards to like switching from just like a regular standard American diet to the starch solution or a starch based diet, do you know typically how long it takes for patients to get to a healthy blood pressure number? About three days. Really? That, that soon? Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Depends on, on what's involved. The first day they are seen by the doctor, they are taken off all their blood pressure pills all their diabetic pills, all their diabetic shots except for insulin. And almost all of their medications are re reduced or stopped. Our, our data shows nearly 90% of the diabetics and uh, patients with blood pressure, their medications are reduced or stopped when they change their diet. And that happens very quickly. What do you know about uh, hypothyroidism, Dr. McDougall? Let's just say by uh, middle age, about 40% of women have hypothyroidism. Wow. That's a Why women? Well, 
Autoimmune diseases are more common in females. I don't know why. I don't even know if they really are, but that's what they say. So uh, destruction of thyroid, producing hypothyroid is created by an autoimmune disease, which is where the body attacks itself. And uh, like for example, the body attacks the joints and they get red and swollen and you have a condition called inflammatory arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, the body makes antibodies. You know, they're supposed to be made to bacteria and viruses and things like that. But when foreign food proteins come in, they treat them like viruses and bacteria and so on. So they make antibodies that uh, fit these uh, food proteins. But they're also similar to the body proteins, and so they will cross-react. It's called molecular mimicry. They cross-react, and so what was made for a foreign substance by our bodies, say pig muscle or cow muscle or cow secretion protein from the milk, uh, once we make those antibodies, because they're not totally specific, they go and attack the joints and cause rheumatoid arthritis. Well, they attack the thyroid also and kill the thyroid gland. It's called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Hashimoto was a Japanese researcher, I think around 1917. Hashimoto's thyroiditis uh, just got his name. It's uh, your doctor will call it autoimmune thyroiditis, autoimmune. And what's happened is you've eaten foreign thyroid gland. It's not exactly like your thyroid gland, but it's real close. It's foreign in its uh, structural makeup. And uh, when that dissimilar but similar tissue is ingested in the body, the body says, hmm, that's foreign, could be a bacteria, could be a virus, maybe I better make an antibody out of it, or for it, to get rid of it like I would a virus or a bacteria. And the body does that, but the body isn't totally specific, and so it cross-reacts with similar proteins that are in our body. So that protein we're talking about is thyroid globula, thyroid thyroid hormone, thyroid tissue. And so what you now have to do is that once you've discovered that this is a cross-reactive molecular mimicry um, mechanism that occurs where the body is attacking a foreign protein, which also attacks you because you're not that similar, you must act, ask where would foreign similar thyroid prote proteins come from? Or would you start looking for people, a source for people to get a thyroid hormone that wasn't specifically human, but close enough? You get that at the lunch meat counter or the hot dog counter. Uh, in the slaughterhouses, they waste nothing. And so when they're making the sausages, they throw on the thyroid glands and you eat the hot dog and you, your body says, this isn't, uh, this isn't normal thyroid tissue, it's foreign, I better make an antibody against it. You go to your doctor, your doctor says you have autoimmune thyroiditis, Ooh, let's tell you it was Hashimoto's. And the uh, doctor says, well, what can we do? And, or you say, what can we do to the doctor? doctor says, nothing except give you supplement. And that is true. I would certainly stop eating the, uh, the hot dogs and any other animal food that would cause this kind of um, uh, autoimmune reaction. They're called autoimmune reactions. But you go to my website and put in the search engine any of these terms and whole articles just about saying exactly what I said, pull up. I, I know with uh, hypothyroidism, they typically recommend, I think, a synthetic thyroid supplement or another version. Like, is there a specific one you recommend? And I, well, you know I recommend the synthetic, don't you? Animal is made from pig and made from cows, oh. the armored thyroid, the natural thyroids. And so you're bringing in animal tissues, which can cause other autoimmune disease reactions. Plus, animal tissues are loaded with microorganisms. Uh, they probably have mad cow prions in them. They certainly have other bacteria and viruses that we share with, uh, with the pigs and the cows that people share. Right. So, um, Anyway, you should stop eating uh, the foreign protein so you can stop enhancing the disease. Uh, 
but you don't want to take and correct the problem, even though you might come up with some reasons as to why the natural would be better because you're a natural girl or whatever. Uh, but you got to consider you're eating a, an infected product, infected with viruses, and uh, therefore I don't recommend it. I recommend the levothyroxine. It's very safe, very easy to use, very uh, effective. Yeah. You talked about some of the civilizations that have survived through time on starches. But recently, like, I mean, it seems like almost everybody is against gluten and wheat these days. And I was just wondering to get your thoughts on why so many people you think are against what we lived on basically for years. Because they're running out of things to write up about that will get people's attention. You've got to have a headline. Uh, like, uh, uh, Bill Clinton becomes vegan. <laughs> Sells a whole bunch of or, uh, you know, uh, President Trump is now on an all-meat diet. Uh, you know, something like that that will make people pick up the newsstands. And that's all it is because the material is something, has qualities that were taught to me by our famous leaders. The materials contain fake news and alternative facts that are written by these new diet gurus. They basically lie. Or as I say, they're stupid. But I'm a nice guy, so I'll say ignorant. <laughs> and, and then what they do is, uh, you know, they don't really get in a room with a bunch of book publishers. But essentially what they do is everybody gets in a room and throws the books at the wall and the one that sticks gets published. But well, you think this one's weird enough? Uh huh? All meat, boy, that's weird enough. We'll, 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 we can make that popular. That's all they care about. They just want to sell the books. They don't care a thing about the, Well, I can't say they don't care a thing about the people. They just want to sell the books. Right. Yeah, and just looking to blame something, and so they pick gluten or wheat. Well, there's always a little bit of truth. You know, about 1 in 250 people have a problem called celiac disease. Also, dermatitis pediformis. And uh, maybe it's one in a hundred, maybe it's one in two fifty, maybe it's none up until recently. I don't know, but it's a very rare condition. And uh, people have been taught to believe that that's a problem for obesity and heart disease and allergies and everything else. So they go through the uh, grocery store and uh, their eyes hit forty percent of the food labels, which are predominantly uh, featuring the word no gluten or no wheat, barley, and rye. And so the customer says, aha, that's where I should pay my attention. I should not eat gulu, which is wheat, barley, and rye, which happen to be healthy plant foods. Hmm, doesn't make a lot of sense here. But they say it, there's such a thing as celiac disease, I will do it. And maybe you help, maybe you help one in 100 people. But you probably injure one in 10,000 in the process where somebody comes in and says, uh, I have celiac disease, don't put any gluten in my food, and the pea soup turns up with croutons, and the customer says, look, I told you I'd fall over and have a seizure if you put gluten in my food, and you did. Well, I didn't believe you. The last 100 people that came in here said the same thing. I gave them the same croutons, and they didn't do anything, so I figured the same with you. Well, that person could get hurt. Uh, by this kind of line. But the real problem is, is when you focus on celiac disease or gluten as the problem and the solution, uh, you cause a dangerous hazardous distraction. <clears throat> and that is a distraction from people looking at the true source of the problem. It's not animal fats and, and the high, high refining and things that we've been taught for 60, 70 years. No, no, you don't have to worry about that at all. You know, in fact, they tell you to eat all the animals you want, even in our dietary doctrines. They tell you the animal food intake is good for you. Like the dietary goals, things like that. Uh, so anyway, I want to give you one. You want to, you know, some people out there are mad at me because I was talking about celiac disease. And I told them it was a dangerous distraction when they should be focusing on animals and the destruction done by animals, which causes over half 
the global warming effects, livestock production. So when they focus on gluten, they focus away from the real cause of destroying our planet, the real cause of your family's sickness. It's a hazardous, dangerous distraction. One that is probably as bad, if not worse, is the GMO. GMO, GMO, genetic modified organisms. Big deal, sells lots of products. Everybody wants, nobody needs eat GMO. Well, there's never been a case of anybody ever sickened by GMO. There's no such thing as a GMO disease. And yet they've been pushing it as, as, a, as the number one thing you should find on the label. It takes their eyes away from the pig, pork chops and the, and the cheeses and the, the things that are killing not just you and I, but your family and the, and the planet. So these theories are not only useless, they are harmful and could be earth shattering. Yeah, I hear what you're saying, Dr. McDo. It's a very hot topic right now, the GMOs thing. Um, I'm not quite sure. Like, I can't give you a definitive answer just because I don't know the long-term effects on GMOs because I, I suppose it's quite new. Um, the only one thing I would say, Dr. McDougall, is for me, it worries me when you see some of the these companies that produce the GMOs get in these suits and they're spraying all these different chemicals on our environment and food. That would be my main concern with that. But um, I'm going to have to wait and see what the long-term effects of... You're going to stand by and watch a million people a year in the United States die from food poisoning caused by foods that are not GMO labeled. So that you can find someday, and likely you'll live another 40 years, you can find the first case of GMO deficiency. Yet you're gonna let a million people a year, just in this country, die from having the wrong dietary advice. Is that right? Is that what you just told me? That doesn't sound like very good math to me. I, I, I personally- Sounds like emotion. Well, here's the thing. I am a promoter of uh, organic whole, plant foods that's that's what i'm all about um but i 100 percent i think the primary thing that people out there listening to this and and everybody everybody should do is the first thing they need to do is stop eating animal products because that's what's feeding our chronic diseases and oil and 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 refined oil and even processed foods to a certain extent any free oil all oil corn oil right mm -hmm. right that, that's my belief, and I think you stand in the same place that I do. Um, is just a, That's the very first step, and after we succeed as a, as a society, once we do that, then we can start looking at these other min minorities and other small, smaller um, areas. My guess, is, my guess is by the first time the first case of a GMO disease is reported in the scientific literature or the newspaper, you'll you'll be a grandfather if if the planet is still here. It, it's, it, they've been looking for it for ten years. They haven't found it. You want to wait another ten years? You got a choice. You're sitting down with me, and you could say, you want to, you you don't know exactly what's wrong with your family, and you don't know what their future is going to be like. Uh, you know you have choices as far as what to believe in. What if you sat down with your family and you say you have one of three choices to feed your family for their personal health and the world they're going to live in, and you're given a choice. Which should you, I mean with great strength, which should you condemn first? GMOs, wheat, barley, or rye, or animal and oil consumption? I mean, really, why should we have this conversation right. if you come to any other conclusion? Because I can't imagine anybody would. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm right there with you. I, I, I completely understand what the problem is, is that people are eating the wrong foods. No, they shouldn't be eating GMO foods. No, they shouldn't be just doing Frankenstein foods. That's, you know, there are lots of reasons. But right. the important reasons to me, which is the health of my family and the world, it's irrelevant. Right. And I can show you in the literature is solidly packed with tens of thousands of research papers that say the same thing. That the personal health, well, I'd say hundreds of thousands, said their personal health and the environmental health are dependent upon the consumption of livestock. 
and other manufacturing process we do, but primarily livestock. Yeah, no, I, I 100% agree and couldn't say it better myself. <laughs> all right, well, you tell all your good listeners out there that I've had fun. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. I mean, this is the third time we've we've done this, so it's always a pleasure having you on. Before you go, Dr. McDougall, I want you to tell people where they can connect with you and learn more about your work. You can learn pretty much everything you want to learn about what I do, free recipes, free plan, free literature, discussions of medical problems, uh, information on our live-in clinics. We have a three-day coming up in September. And in August, we have a 10-day program, which is a medical clinic, where we take people off their drugs, et cetera. And uh, all kinds of information comes out weekly from our website. And that's drmcdougall.com, spelled D-R-M-C-D-O-U-G-A-L-L.com. And you'll reach me there. You'll find out everything. Come to, come to one of our weekends or come to one of our, uh, our clinics. Let's get to know you.